Israel is committing mass murder in Gaza. Something like 85% of all the buildings have been damaged or destroyed. At least 15,000 people have been killed and we know there are probably thousands more bodies in the wreckage. And Israel's only justification for this slaughter is the existence of Hamas, which carried out the daring raid into Israel on the 7th of October. Israel calls them terrorists and human animals. The Israeli Defence Minister Yoav Gallant vowed to, quote, wipe Hamas off the face of the earth, and it's clear that Israel will take many, many, many Palestinians with them. Joe Biden has backed Netanyahu's murderous assault, although he has voiced some concern about civilians, but at the same time as supplying bombs and weapons to Israel for its its attacks. And of course, Albanese has come along with that argument too, uh, has defended the right of Israel to defend itself, which really means the right of Israel to commit genocide. So many dead so many displaced, but the question arises, who are Hamas? You're listening to The Sound of Solidarity, brought to you by Solidarity. We're a revolutionary socialist group in Australia, and if you'd like to find out more about us, our website is solidarity.net.au. I'm David Glanz, and I'm recording this episode on unceded Wurundjeri land in Narm, or Melbourne. So, Hamas are terrorists. Well, funnily enough, most of the world doesn't think this way. The number of countries that designate Hamas as a terrorist organisation is quite small. It's the European Union, Israel, of course, the United Kingdom, Japan, Canada and the United States. In Paraguay and New Zealand, only the military wings of Hamas are regarded as terrorists and the political and welfare organisations are not so described. In Australia, the military wing of Hamas, the Isaldin al Qassam Brigades, were listed as a terrorist organisation in 2003, but the political wing was only listed as a terrorist organisation in 2022, last year. So in other words, the vast majority of the world does not regard Hamas as a terrorist organisation. We're talking about almost the totality of the global south. We're talking about Russia, China and even the United Nations. That designation doesn't matter very much for solidarity because we support the right of national liberation movements to fight back and to fight for freedom. We supported and our predecessors supported the right of the Algerians to fight the French the Vietnamese to fight the French and then to fight the Americans and Australians in Vietnam for, for liberation. We supported the right of the guerrilla movements in Timor-Leste to fight for freedom from Indonesia. We continue to support the right of the people of West Papua to fight for liberation from Indonesia. So for us it's very simple. We unconditionally support all those fighting for national liberation. We don't judge people on their politics. We don't demand that they agree with everything that we say. They are fighting for national liberation. Their victory would be a a win for their people and it would be a blow to imperialism worldwide. Okay, let's backtrack a moment and talk about Hamas. Who are they? Where do they come from? Hamas is an acronym for the Arabic words which translate as Islamic resistance movement and Hamas means zeal or strength in Arabic. Hamas emerged from the Mujama al-Islamiyah which was the Gazan arm of the Muslim Brotherhood and that was in 1987 during the first Intifada, the first mass Palestinian uprising. Now for Islamophobes, The idea of the Muslim Brotherhood is very scary, but actually the Muslim Brotherhood, which was founded in Egypt, is a very conservative organisation in every sense of the term. Not only is it 
focused very heavily on health and welfare, but when it came to the revolt against the dictatorship of Mubarak in Egypt in 2011, the Muslim Brotherhood did everything they could to prevent their supporters from going onto the streets. They didn't like the Mubarak regime, but they were prepared to cohabit with it, and they were scared of the idea of revolution. Now, in the end, the youth movement of the Muslim Brotherhood went onto the streets, along with secular activists, nationalist activists, and socialist activists, and they dragged the Muslim Brotherhood along behind them. But Hamas has inherited that relatively conservative approach taken up by the Muslim Brotherhood. And when Hamas first emerged, its focus was almost exclusively on health and welfare. Hamas runs nurseries, soup kitchens, libraries, sporting clubs, a television channel and a children's magazine. But it adopted a political statement in 1988, shortly after its founding, a covenant. And that covenant called for the destruction of Israel, jihad against Zionism, and a rejection of so-called peace settlements, including the Camp David Agreement of 1978. It also included the aim for Palestine to become an Islamic state. And the covenant was a combination of a firm rejection of a compromise that Palestine should be free, coupled with some quite reactionary politics. There were anti-Semitic passages calling for violence against Jewish people, and there was sexism. According to the Covenant in 1988, the role of women within the movement was restricted to raising children. Hamas began to shift its focus after the first Intifada ended in 1993, and it began to take on a much more political uh, stance. After the ending of the first Intifada, there was an agreement struck between the Palestine Liberation Organization and the Israeli government, with the support of the US and the European Union. And that agreement was known as the Oslo Accords. The Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, was dominated by a party called Fatah, and really Fatah is the backbone of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank today. And in return for recognising Israel, the PLO and its allies gained limited control over the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. But it was very limited control indeed, and we'll discuss this a little bit further on. But in essence, the PLO became Israel's police in the West Bank. Uh, They would brutalise opposition, they would hand people over to the Israelis, and they stood by as Israeli settlers in their hundreds of thousands flooded into the West Bank, stealing the best land, stealing the water, stealing the olive groves. And Hamas rejected compromise. It refused to stand in the 1996 elections that followed the Oslo Accords, and it became the focus for disillusionment. The group then became central to the Second Intifada, which erupted in 2000. And its willingness to resist meant it became very popular. And when elections were held in 2006 for the Palestinian Authority, Hamas won 73 seats out of 132. In other words, they won a majority. Far from being a terrorist organisation imposing its will on the Palestinians, it actually became the elected government of the Palestinian people. But Fatah staged a coup in the West Bank, which was backed by Israel and US, leaving Hamas in control only of Gaza. And then Israel tried to play the two parties off against each other, because the Oslo Accords raised the prospect of a two-state solution, of an Israel and a Palestine existing side by side. It was never realistic. It has become even less realistic over time, but Israel wanted to destroy even the slimmest prospect, so it deliberately supported Hamas against the PLO in order to weaken the PLO. They saw the PLO as secular, and they saw sections of the PLO as left-wing, and they wanted to ensure that the PLO would not make progress. In the 1980s, the Israeli military governor, Brigadier General Yitzhak Segev, told the New York Times that Hamas and other Islamist groups could be a counterweight 
to the PLO. And between 2012 and 2018, Netanyahu gave his approval for Qatar, one of the Gulf states, to transfer a total of about a billion US dollars to Gaza, knowing full well that about half of that would be creamed off by Hamas. Now the pendulum has swung. Israel is desperate to prop up the Palestinian Authority and its president, Mahmoud Abbas, because they're worried Hamas now represents the main threat to Israel. And the PLO have become abject collaborators. The Palestinian Authority has arrested dozens of journalists and union organisers, and its supporters beat to death prominent Palestinian activist Nizar Banat because he exposed corruption in the Palestinian Authority. That hostility to the PA has continued. A poll held in June, so before the current round of fighting, found that 63% of Palestinians in the occupied territories, so that's both the West Bank and Gaza, considered the Palestinian Authority as operating in Israel's interests. And an organisation called Arab World for Research and Development held a poll during the fourth week of the current conflict in Gaza, of the attacks on Gaza, and found that support for the Palestinian Authority amongst Palestinians across the occupied territories has fallen to just 10%. By contrast, the three fighting organisations, the Al-Qassam Brigades, Islamic Jihad, and the Al-Aqsa Brigades, have the support of, respectively, 89% of Palestinians, 84% of Palestinians, and 80%. And Hamas itself has the support of 76% of Palestinians. The majority of those polled either strongly supported, 59%, or supported to some extent, 16%, so that's 75% in total, supported the October 7th attacks carried out by Hamas and other factions. But interestingly, 75% also support the establishment of a national unity government after the war. Only 14% support the establishment of a government led by Hamas, and only 8% support a government led by Fatah, which is the party at the heart of the Palestinian Authority. So Palestinians support resistance, but they do not give a blank check to Hamas. And part of that is because of the politics of Hamas. Now, I mentioned earlier on that Solidarity gives unconditional support to organisations fighting for national liberation. And that obviously includes the Palestinian National Liberation Movement. But that support is not uncritical. And when I say it's not uncritical, I'm not talking about nitpicking. I'm talking about disagreements about how the Palestinians can win. We would support the Palestinian National Liberation Movement even if its tactics were wrong, but we would support it nonetheless. But we would criticise those tactics because we want to see the Palestinians win national liberation. Now, it's important to see that Hamas's politics have shifted. There's often an idea that a, um, a religiously... Uh, centred organisation, and Hamas is an Islamist organisation, is somehow so conservative and so dogmatic that it cannot change its views. But is Hamas is essentially a political movement, and it has had to respond to the growing radicalisation amongst Palestinians themselves, the results of successive intifadas, the, exu- the result of organising uh, by students and workers and women around all sorts of issues, and Hamas has had to shift its position. So in 2017, it adopted a new covenant. Critics of Hamas like to pretend this new covenant doesn't exist. They refer back time and time again to 1988 because of the language which was anti-Semitic and use that as a way of hammering Hamas. But in 2017, the language and the political ideas shifted substantially. So gone was the rhetoric about transforming Palestine into an Islamic state. And that's important because Palestinians themselves include Christian minorities and people who have no religious identification. And so that is the beginning of 
a shift towards recognising that Palestine should be the land of all its peoples, regardless of their religion or lack of it. As early as 2006, Hamas had appointed a Christian as a minister in its, in its leadership. Palestinian women did not put up with the sexism of 1988. They organised and they campaigned. And in 2021, Jamila al-Shanti became the first woman to be appointed to the group's political bureau. And importantly, the anti-Semitic language was dumped. This is now what Hamas stands for, and I'm quoting. Hamas does not wage a struggle against the Jews because they are Jewish, but wages a struggle against the Zionists who occupy Palestine. Yet it is the Zionists who constantly identify Judaism and the Jews with their own colonial project and illegal entity. And I think actually that statement carries a lot of weight and I think the increasing shrillness and the bizarre accusations that the supporters of Israel make against Palestinian supporters, I think underpins that second sentence. It is the Zionists who say that if you are against Israel, you are against all Jews. But that's not the case. And I'm speaking as a Jew who supports the Palestinians myself. There are growing numbers of Jews around the world, not least in the United States, who are standing up for the Palestinians and rejecting the idea that the Zionists speak for them or speak for me. But despite the political shifts in 2017, there are ways in which Hamas is not so very different from the Palestine Liberation Organisation. And I think we can argue that in some ways it's on the same trajectory. Now this seems odd. The PLO was a secular organisation. One of its major groups was led for a long, long time by a Christian. The PLO had within its ranks people who identified as leftists whereas Hamas is a, an Islamist organisation which, despite the shifts, still has a religious flavour to it. But I think Hamas is making two fundamental mistakes which are taking them down the same path as the PLO. Both of these are reflected in the 2017 Covenant. The first is this, and again I quote, Hamas considers the establishment of a fully sovereign and independent Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its capital along the lines of the 4th of June 1967 with the return of the refugees and the displaced to their homes from which they were expelled to be a formula of national consensus. Now what does the reference to the 4th of June 1967 mean? Well on the 5th of June Israel launched what became known as the Six-Day War. It seized control of East Jerusalem, it seized control of the West Bank, of Gaza and of the Golan Heights, which is part of Syria and which it's never returned. So what Hamas is effectively saying is, it is prepared to accept a Palestinian state on the West Bank, in East Jerusalem and Gaza. In other words, it is a de facto acceptance of the existence of Israel. And so although Hamas has built its popular support by its intransigent opposition to Israel and its racism and its slaughter, like the PLO, it is prepared to accept the existence of an Israeli state. And the existence of an Israeli state means the existence of apartheid, it means the existence of stolen land, it means that Palestinians who were born or whose parents or grandparents were born within the 1948 boundaries, the boundaries that existed up to the 4th of June 1967 would not be able to return. Now the statement in 2017 is not the only evidence that Hamas is prepared to compromise. In February and March of 2021, Fatah, which is the Palestinian Authority leadership, and Hamas agreed to hold elections for the presidency of the Palestinian Authority, its legislative council, and Hamas's entry into the Palestine Liberation Organization. And the elections were planned to take place in accordance with the Oslo Accords, after which negotiations would continue with Israel towards the establishment of a Palestinian state. This was an enormous concession. The agreement included a commitment to uphold international law, 
establish a state within the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital, recognise the PLO as the legitimate and exclusive umbrella framework, conduct a peaceful popular struggle and transfer the separate government in the Gaza Strip to the Palestinian Authority. And on top of that, Hamas agreed not to put forward a presidential candidate. So Hamas, despite its militancy, despite its armed struggle, despite its intransigent language, was prepared to come into the fold, join the PLO as the essentially the united Palestinian movement, but on the basis of acceptance of Israel and that Palestinian land uh, would not be regained in its totality. Israel rejected that agreement. All those concessions were not enough. They want total subservience and total surrender. And it's the case that actually Hamas had indicated it was prepared to compromise even before the adoption of its 2017 covenant. So in 2014, in the presence of the Emir of Qatar in Doha, and that is where uh, Hamas's leadership is largely based today. The Fatah leadership headed by Mahmoud Abbas met with the Hamas leadership headed by Khaled Mashal. And the full minutes of the talks were published in an official Emirati document. And in essence, the message of the Hamas leadership was clear. If you and Fatah are convinced that you can get a state from Israel along the 1967 lines through negotiations, Go for it. We will not interfere. So Hamas, at the end of the day, is prepared to accept the partition of Palestine and prepared to accept the existence of Israel. That's not the message, by and large, they give to their supporters, but that's at the centre of their politics. I think there's a second key way in which Hamas has actually taken a step back from the fight for national liberation, which is dangerous to the cause of the Palestinian people and which justifies criticism. I'm going to quote from the 2017 Covenant again. Hamas believes in cooperating with all states that support the rights of the Palestinian people. It opposes intervention in the internal affairs of any country. It also refuses to be drawn into disputes and conflicts that take place among different countries. Why is that significant? It's significant because this was the politics of Fatah and the PLO pretty much from its founding in the 1950s and its development in the 60s and 70s. The PLO said it would not criticise and it would not act in a revolutionary way against the ruling classes of any of the Arab states, whether that is Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq and so on. Why did they say that? They said that because they were fighting for the national liberation of Palestine as Hamas is today, but they saw themselves as the future ruling class of Palestine. They saw themselves as running Palestine as an independent national state, an independent capitalist state, and they do, would not welcome the interference of other Arab ruling classes into the affairs of Palestine, and in return, they offered non-interference into the affairs of the Arab states. The trouble is that the Arab states, then and today, mouth slogans of solidarity with the Palestinians, but in reality are prepared and have been prepared over time more and more to come to agreements with Israel, to come to agreements that bind them more and more into Western imperialism. And the result has been disaster for the Palestinian movement. The clearest example of that came in Jordan in 1970. The Palestinian resistance had operated on the West Bank. After the Six Day War in 1967, they retreated into Jordan, which has a substantial Palestinian section of the population. The Jordanian government was petrified that the PLO and its supporters would generate and catalyse a revolutionary movement in Jordan itself, which would lead to the overthrow of the royal family and the ruling class. And in September 1970, in the 
Events that became known as Black September, the Jordanian government launched an assault on the PLO, on the Palestinians, and drove them out of Jordan with substantial losses. And the PLO then had to go to Lebanon, later to North Africa. The Arab ruling classes, and Jordan was not the only criminal in this, was prepared to turn on the Palestinians if they became too much of a radical threat. The response should have been for the Palestinians to take up the revolutionary gauntlet to combine with workers and peasants and students and the poor in the Arab nations and join in revolution across the region. But the PLO was never going to do that and the Hamas has gone down the same path. The problem is the Arab rulers have become more and more tightly linked to Israel and to Western imperialism. Israel was the first to strike a peace deal with Israel and then under the Abraham Accords a series of Gulf states also struck peace deals and if it hadn't been for the events of October the 7th Saudi Arabia would also have struck a deal a normalization arrangement with Israel. So all the Arab ruling classes talk about solidarity with Palestine and they act in solidarity with Israel. Hamas is not just unwilling to take on the Arab ruling classes because of what it considers its future status to be, but also because it itself is tightly tied in with the economy of the region. It's calculated that in normal times that Hamas gets something like 500 million US dollars a year, so about 750 million Australian dollars from firms which are registered across the Middle East. One of those firms built the Afra Mall, which is Sudan's first shopping mall. Another has mines near Khartoum, the Sudanese capital. Under what circumstances would Hamas support the revolution which has unfolded on two occasions in Sudan if it risks them losing their investments in that state? Another Hamas-owned or influenced company built skyscrapers in Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates. Hamas is tightly linked in, economically and politically, today, not just in the future, with the Arab ruling classes. And they see themselves as a future Arab ruling class. So they turn their backs on the revolutionary potential that exists in the region. And it, it is here, most of all, that we offer a socialist an alternative. We admire the Palestinian National Liberation Movement and its fight for freedom. We support it, but we feel that if, as Hamas goes down the path of the PLO in accepting the existence of Israel, in accepting the untouchability of backward Arab ruling classes, that it would lead to disaster. And we argue that there needs to be the building of new parties, of socialists in the Middle East. Partly, some of those exist already today in Egypt, in Lebanon, and under awful situations amongst uh, the Syrian diaspora. But we need to build new revolutionary parties that fight tooth and nail for Palestinian liberation, but that understand that Palestinian liberation will only come about, can only come about, when the power of the regional working class is unlocked. Above all in Egypt, a country of 110 million with a massive working class, a massive proletariat that has the power to overthrow not just the dictatorship in Egypt today, but to open the gates to Rafa, to pour through into Gaza, support military and practical, and to generate and encourage workers across the region to rise up to simultaneously overthrow their own dictatorships and to come to the aid of the Palestinians. Imagine a situation where millions of Jordanians, Egyptians, Lebanese, Syrians and more come to the Israeli border in solidarity with the Palestinians. The Israeli state could fall. And that's the vision that solidarity has for the future of the Palestinian people, for liberation, political, national and social across the region.